So Daniel, could you just walk us through a little bit of your background um, and also maybe give some background um, behind Fennel uh, and underlying that, why ESG is, is important to you? Yeah, yeah. So I don't have a traditional finance background. Actually, before I started Fennel, I was doing my physics PhD in dark matter research. I was working over at Livermore National Lab, looking for dark matter, and then also helping the government um, with nuclear detection, essentially. And I lived in the um, Bay Area, where we started to get a fifth season of the year called Fire. And we were wearing the N95 masks before they were cool. And we would you know, go to work, couldn't see the sun some days, and couldn't breathe the air. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I joined physics because it was this really mysterious, beautiful thing to study about the universe. Um, but I was really worried about life on Earth. And I was really worried about, you know, in 20 years, could I look back and say, hey, I had contributed to something that I really felt passionate about. So I started to explore, you know, what I could do with the career after. And in my second year of the physics PhD program, I took this class called econophysics, which was how do you take physics models and apply them to the stock market? Essentially, how do you be a quant? And I was like a closeted financial person. I'd, you know, wake up, I'm on the West Coast, I'd wake up at like 6 a.m. for market open, do my little code for trading bot, then go into lab and come back. Um, as I approached graduation, there were kind of three things in the world that was happening that inspired me to start Fennel. The first was you had companies like Tesla exploding in the stock market. They weren't based on fundamentals. It was based on a movement, right? It was a value play. People knew a world in 20 years couldn't exist without an electric vehicle company like Tesla. What happened as a result of them exploding in the stock market? Well, foreign and domestic policy started to change. By 2035, you know, only sale of electric vehicles in California and New Jersey, um, similarly in Germany. And then Ford and GM started to invest billions into the infrastructure around electric vehicles. So, you know, I started to think, okay, capital markets talk. There's clearly influence here. Uh, the second thing that happened was there was a small hedge fund called Engine Number One, $50 million fund. They had invested roughly 10 to $12 million in ExxonMobil with the sole intent of reducing carbon emission. So they wanted to take over the board seats of Exxon and they were successful. They took over four of the 12 board seats with the support of BlackRock and all these large financial institutions. And then the third was the GameStop movement at the time, right? It was incredibly inspiring to see this group of retail investors come together for a common cause and take on a financial institution, you know? So I think a light bulb went off in my head. Well, why can't we put all three of those, you know, into the same place? Why can't we make it easy for people to invest in a world they want you know, to live in, uh, get engaged with the companies and find a community to, to do that. Um, that's what kind of started Fennel in the early days. And at the heart of what Fennel does is two things, although I like to see them as the same thing, ESG and shareholder voting. And so Fennel itself is a brokerage firm. So it's a mobile-based investing application. You can go onto the app, buy and sell stocks like you normally would with any other brokerage firm. There's two main differences. One, we provide you a lot more data. Some of that data is ESG. We'll talk about that today. And the second is about the brokerage practices themselves. So we don't accept payment for order flow and we don't lend out our securities. And the reason we don't lend out our securities is because the vote follows the share. So when you lend out a share, you no longer own the vote. So that's kind of what Fennel is. That's what led me to start this whole thing. Yeah, that's a super interesting story, so much to unpack there. But maybe if we just take a step back and you kind of alluded to it a little bit there with the forest fires that we've all seen on the news and we see sea levels rising and all the, all this stuff. And maybe that's just the environmental side of things. Yeah. If we take a step back, it's ESG, right? So could you explain the S and the G for, yeah. for our audience and its significance in the invest, investing landscape? Yeah, I love this. So one thing to understand about ESG investing, first, let's just start calling it investing. Let's not call it ESG investing. It's really about data. So 
the problem that I see with retail investors is that they don't understand the risks fully, the risks that they're taking within a company. So yes, we can talk about the environmental risks. There's a lot to unpack there. For social and governance, it's more things you know about in your day-to-day -day interactions. So for the social aspect, it's how do they treat their workers? How do they treat their community, right? So are they paying their men and women equally? Is that you know conducive for good talent ret retention? Uh, how do they interact with uh, lobbying measures? Do they lobby the government more aggressively than their competitors? Do they have policies, social policies in place? So social really is about how do they treat their workforce and how do they interact with people, corporate social responsibility. The governance aspect, I think, is personally more important than that. It's how do they treat their shareholders? How do they treat their stakeholders? So you can look anywhere from, you know, the board of a company. How are they being compensated? How often is their ten tenure? Uh, do they have truly independent board members that are going to keep them in track? Does the CEO own majority voting rights for the company? So even if all the shareholders got together and said, we don't think this is a good idea, could that CEO plummet the stock to zero if they so chose to do? Um, how is their... Yeah, just how is their board compensated? How is their management team stacked? Gender diversity, all of that stuff. So you can imagine as an investor, it'd be important to know um, the risks associated with those with those data points. Yeah, and I think for, for retail investors, uh, especially when they're learning, but as they get more experience, it's the financial data metrics that they you know, are most comfortable with. What's the return on equity? What's the share price? What's the price to sales? So my first reaction to what you just said is, how do, how do you quantify ESG? And can you give some examples? Because I could imagine maybe, let's say, talent retention rates, um, you know, it, it could be a percentage or, you know, a, a data point that you could look at. But I could imagine there's also other soft metrics, if it's fair to call those, that may be a bit harder to quantify. Could you just yeah, give absolutely. some examples of, of some of those? Yeah. So, I mean, I really like... I mean, I really like your point um, about first time investors looking at things like price to earnings ratio. I think that is table stakes. And what people don't realize is all these high net worth individuals and large financial institutions, they're looking at way more data points. So if you ever feel like you invest in something, the stock market turns the other way, it's because you really don't have access to the same data. And maybe you're not looking at some of that data. So let's talk about a few examples. Um, in the space, right? And let's talk about how ESG can be used as a risk framework in multiple ways. So the first is let's talk about environmental. I think that's the simplest to understand. The common examples I use is let's take a real life world example that happened with the war in Ukraine. All of a sudden, oil prices shot up dramatically, right? Uh, the narration at the time was, okay, let's look at uh, Companies' profit margins, how are they going to be hurt in their quarterly earnings reports with this increase in oil sales, oil prices? You might want to understand how exposed is a company to oil within their operating margin, all that stuff. Currently, you can't do that. But what you can do is look at what is their scope one emission, what's their scope two emission, so how much carbon are they emitting. When the Ukraine crisis was happening, you might want to understand how do oil prices affect that specific company. So you might be able to look at correlated things like carbon emissions. You could also think at beverage companies using water. Are they grabbing their water from um, water scarce areas or are they effective in how they're using their water? You can look at oil energy companies and understand how much carbon per oil barrel are they producing and would that affect their cost, et cetera. So in the environmental space, you know, there's quite a, a lot to look at. And we know that policy is changing quite dramatically in the states around environmental risk. I mean, just, you know, recently, uh, states have, you know, been talking about looking at the Colorado River and how do we use our water effectively there, you should understand the risks there. Um, from a social space, you know, some examples could be, again, looking at talent retention. So there are employee satisfaction scores that are present within the company, sometimes that they run internally to see how they're employees are doing. Uh, you can look at the, you know, pay gap between men and women. Is there, you know, an obvious cause for concern there? You could look at the percentage of women managers. So let's say we're talking about the Me Too movement 
and you're in the news and media industry investing in that space, you'd want to know how exposed are they, are they, are they treating their men and their women equally? And that might be able to tell you something about their culture and a little bit more there. Um, governance, I could go on. I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, recent in the news, large CEOs, large companies uh, heading, heading their companies in the wrong direction, but because they have majority ownership, um, you know, people can't really push back uh, upon them. So you'd have to look at some of those metrics. And thinking about uh, maybe ESG scores, is there like a blanket kind of, this is, you know, this is the framework? Because I would imagine that for, for many people, obviously we're all individuals and we all have different, you know, beliefs and, you yeah. know, uh, expectations of what that means to us. Are you able to, you know, weight that according to, yes, and, you know, environmental things are, you know, climate change is really important to me. So I really yeah. want to focus on just that and the other things aren't as important to me. Yeah, we've thought quite deeply about this at Fennel. And so we've designed the product to suit that exact need. So there's multiple ways we do this. The first is we spread your vote over 10 different themes, right? The, the high level thing to understand is here, there is no blanketed approach to ESG. That's one of the biggest criticisms of ESG. It's my criticism to ESG. Although I really don't think that that's necessary because to your point, there should be different frameworks for thinking about different aspects. And if you go down that rabbit hole, there's hundreds of frameworks. Now, uh, the way we solve that to your point is we have 10 themes. We rank companies relative to their peers directly. So you can compare apples to apples and um, you can get some breakdown. We don't just stop there though, to your point, we don't want to just show you a score. We want to show you the underlying metrics. So let's say I do care about carbon emissions as a theme. I don't want to just care about scope one emissions. Let's say I want to understand the breakdown of scope one and scope two emissions, or I want to understand what their percentage of renewable energy that they're using to, to fuel their company, et cetera. So at Fennel, we have you know, over 700 data points um, of the underlying metrics of the companies. And we think as an investor, you know, you should be informed to the point where if you know what you want, use the ESG scores as a guiding direction, but then go in and look at the underlying fundamental data points as well. Yeah, I think and, that's... And, and to your point, like you're not going to find, it's very hard to find a company that is tackling all risks around ESG the same way. And so if, if your hypothesis and you really care about environmental issues, then definitely try to focus on those. Yeah, that's, um, I think that, that's the right approach. And, you know, looking at the last few years, we've obviously seen a lot of, let's say, market excess, you know, with speculative, if it's charging companies or, uh, you know, r big bets on the future. And, you know, when we saw Tesla explode and, you know, other plays like that, other investors were really, retail investors were really looking for that next big kind of uh, opportunity. Um, so I guess my question is to to what extent has the last few years impacted maybe your thoughts on ESG given the share price movements? And then, of course, we had the sub subsequent reset of general tech valuations last year. So how do you how has the last few years really shaped your kind of view on ESG, the ESG investment landscape and companies operating in it? Yeah, I'm more bullish than ever on all of it. And I'll kind of explain why. So the first is you start to look at what institutional investors are doing. As of the end of 2022, over $2.5 trillion has moved into ESG funds. Over half a trillion has moved into ESG green bonds. And you have over $40 trillion of divestment from these large, you know, um, oil companies or energy companies or, yeah, just from a divestment lens. So in terms of ESG, I think it's growing at an accelerating pace. And I think it's going to hit retail and retail have to start joining the, the conversation. Uh, on top of that, you look at the shareholder votes that are going through. So about you know five to 10 years ago, the shareholder votes were primarily focused on profit-driven um, metrics. And you'd have you know corporate raiders or you'd have supporters of the company come in and, and talk about you know, the company's financials. There's been over a hundred percent increase in the amount of ESG proposals in the shareholder boardroom just the past two years. And so companies are starting to respond to um, 
these proposals in quite dramatic fashions by either hiring people into their board that focus on ESG risk or hiring people into their investor relations committee that focus on ESG risk. So what I'm seeing from an ESG perspective is I think it's it's growing and I think it's going to continually grow. And like I said, I think it's just going to be called investing once everyone has access to these tools. The other thing it's made me realize is, look, I started investing between 2008 and this recent you know, market crash. And one thing that I think a lot of retail investors learned over the past couple of years is it's very easy to get burned, right? Whether that's in crypto or whether that's, you know, trading specific stocks on the stock market, you shouldn't, if you're really trying to invest in a company long-term, a lot of these other brokerage applications, they're for day trading or for, they're for trading. Great. But what happens when you have your wealth grow? How are you going to manage it effectively? How are you going to understand your risk? You're not just trying to throw all of your life's work away. You need to understand I'm putting my money into hopefully a place that will generate more returns for myself. So what it taught me was to think about my investments over a longer time horizon. And I think ESG really helps you think like that because you're not thinking, okay, what's their last quarterly earnings report? You're thinking, okay, climate change is coming in 10 years. Which companies are positioning themselves now to account for those changes that are coming? And I'm not looking for the quick dollar. I'm looking to retire quite comfortably. And so, you know, if you had invested $5,000 in Tesla eight years ago, you would have been a very wealthy individual when they reached their peak. And so how do I start to identify more of those types of companies that are positioning themselves to the future? Right now, maybe, you know, uh, Gen Z and millennial consumers are six to 10 percent of the purchasing power but they don't buy anything unless it's sustainable or the company has good social values. And there's about to be the largest intergenerational wealth transfer in history um, and I, over the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm pretty sure that the purchasing power of these Gen Z and millennials are going to grow. And so the companies that can position themselves in this way are likely going to be the people that benefit the most from that transfer. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. It's kind of like aligning providing a kind of at, to, to retail investors that long-term perspective, which actually is the best way to invest anyway, stay invested, think long-term, bet on the companies that essentially are going to, you know, uh, thrive over the long-term and kind of those that will swap thrive over the long-term will have ESG, let's say friendly policies and governance embedded in them. So it's a great kind of way of aligning both of those, those things. Um, and I, yeah, uh, completely agree on the intergenerational wealth like you know millenn I, th and I, I think also millennials and gen z and gen x are, are, are very much um more receptive to esg they do really consider that and even when you look at some of our um surveys from our you know modern modern investor polls many are thinking about you know oh, does this really align with my values you know what am i investing in but maybe don't have the data so this is obviously where, where you guys come in yeah. So yeah. ESG integration is kind of often a way to align investment strategies with those sustainability goals. Um, so how can retail investors really ensure that those companies that they invest in are genuinely committed to these ESG <laughs> principles? Yeah, uh, that's again a problem we've thought about quite a bit. So we're tackling this in a few ways. The first is, the first approach is to look at the underlying data. Don't listen to the marketing. Don't listen to the greenwashing. Greenwashing right now is, is running quite rampant. You know, I think government is starting to step in more. And, you know, just recently, within the past few months, they passed a proposal that said that ETFs, you know, have to, they can't just greenwash. If they're saying they're carbon neutral or whatever, they have to show you the underlying data points. So um, look at the underlying data points. Right. If they're talking to you that they're green focused, they have, you know, an ad campaign of cows and happy grass, go look at their carbon emissions, go look at all this, you know, data on fennel. That's one. Uh, the second is for all of you ETF investors out there. Also at fennel, we do full breakdowns in the ESG space. So we don't just do individual stocks. We say any collection of your portfolio of an ETF, of a watch list of anything, right? We're going to give you the breakdown across ESG, and then we're going to say, what's the average carbon emission in this ETF relative to, you know, an index tracking thing that, you know, relates to that ESG metric. 
So that's one way uh, you can start to understand a company's impact. The other is to look very closely at their shareholder votes. So it's very telling how a board and how the executive team handle the proposals around ESG that are coming at their annual shareholder meetings. If they're genuinely against it outright, there's a you know that there's a problem there with, with management and this issue. If their approach is more nuanced, they're saying, look, we hear your proposal around XYZ reduction of carbon emissions, but we think it needs to go a step further or we're doing this and that, that also can help you understand what the company's um, objectives are and how they're thinking about, about this. If we look at a company, let's say Apple, that is, let's say, well known, um, there's often, you know, maybe perception of a trade off in terms of financial returns and, let's say, sustainability objectives, social governance, whatever you want to call it. So, a company like Apple has, you know, been reported, you know, uh, in the news, as we know, probably don't need to mention it with you know, different things regarding their factories and workers and how, you know, mm-hmm. how they treat yeah. them. Yeah. So how should a retail investor who loves Apple products, you know, can obviously see it's a good stock because it, you know, uh, the, the fundamentals are strong. How would you advise a retail investor just to think about, you know, that potential trade-off? And it, of course, doesn't have to be a trade-off, but, you know, there's yeah. a perception yeah. that people have between those financial returns and those kind of ESG related um, factors? Yeah, I I genuinely love this question. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about this conception of performance versus ESG and sustainability. Sometimes ESG considerations could involve trade-offs between those. Sometimes they could not. So just like price to earnings could sometimes dictate performance of a, you know, Company sometimes it could not. You have certain companies that are well over the average, and it doesn't make sense, and they st- still keep growing. Bain and Echo Vardis actually recently did a study that found strong ESG performance is a sign of doing good business, and they pointed to things like more women on the board actually have had better financial res- you know returns for that company, or you know any one of these various ESG themes. So. There are so many data points, you're you're obviously going to find some correlations between performance and not, right? And this may be a, you know, chicken and egg situation where essentially correlation doesn't mean causation. So that's always something to be cautious of. Uh, But it shows that they don't have to be opposed to, to one another, right? And it shows that you don't have to just, yeah, think about it in this one way. The second, the more important way for the past, you know, decade, few decades, divestment has been the main way to, sh- to show your voice. Oh, I'm going to stop purchasing their product. I'm not going to invest. I'm going to take my investments out because I don't agree with the board. Believe it or not, that's not how high net worth individuals and financial institutions operate on a day-to-day basis, and neither should you as a retail investor. So you're giving away an incredible amount of power by divesting, right? And not organizing with you. So invest in com- companies that you believe in from a financial standpoint that are doing well performing well. And I think that is, you know, the purpose of the stock market is to make, you know, financial returns and to get invested within companies. But there's a new way that's emerging. And again, like high net worth individuals do this, which is to invest in companies, maybe you don't agree with 100%, but to change them from the inside for the better. And you can do that with shareholder, you know, voting. So there's countless studies out there too, that talk about I mean, let's just think about this from the framework of an investor. I see this company that's performing incredibly well from a financial standpoint. I see areas of their business that are insanely risky to me, right? It's growing in the news. There is climate risk associated with it. Whatever my hypothesis around the ESG space is like, okay, I'm going to invest in that company and try to steer their board or try to influence the individuals within the company, right? Because there's always workers within these large corporations that are advocating for these changes, I'm going to put my shares and my voice behind them. I'm going to show them that as an investor, I actually think this is the right movement because my investment will increase, right? The value of my investment will increase. Can you imagine Apple had all this profitability, but they figured out a way to have better, you know, supply chain management, right? Or treat their workers more for, you know, not trying to single out a single company, but 
I'm just saying that is a more powerful way of thinking about your investments. Yeah, I can see how it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation because you would also imagine that a company as successful as Apple or as profitable as Apple or others, it doesn't have to be Apple, have more propensity, more firepower to actually address those issues rather than someone, you know, another company that is growing, growing quickly, maybe not profitable yet, but is growing, you know, into their valuation that maybe you know, it is important to them, but not now, but in the future when they have the means to do so, they can actually take action. Is that kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like the third world, first world debate around right. carbon emission. You know, yeah. we've used all this, uh, we've emitted all this carbon and now we want you not to. And so you have to think who is the responsibility on right now? Yeah. When we look at um, ESG kind of moving forward uh, and again, not ESG, just investing. Um, yeah. Could you walk to, you know, talk to any emerging trends or developments that you're really excited about that is, you know, that's coming maybe in the short term? And then actually it might be worth just zooming out again and looking to the medium to long term um, and talking to those kind of timeframes as well. Yeah, so I think we've talked, you know, about a lot of them. The first that I'm most excited about now it's becoming more mainstream. Like you said, even your customer base is, is thinking about it. Apps like Fennel, more products are coming out to help it become more accessible. So genuinely super excited about that stuff. Uh, we also talked about the rise of ESG themes and proposals and shareholder votes, which I think is incredibly important. That's going to keep growing, keep rising. There's two areas that I think really matter. So my, you know, my position in this space is the government really needs to get involved in some ways right? Um, To just help clean up. This is, you know, this, these are regulated public companies, there needs to be certain standards and practices in place. So the investor doesn't get blindsided. The first exciting thing is that the SEC is, you know, put forward and passed a proposal around um, carbon emissions, accurately stating the carbon emissions around a company. I think that is a great trend. And I think the government is going to try more and more to have public companies, you know, um, report on the metrics that are important to an investor to understand because ESG really is a risk framework and carbon emission numbers are risks. Um, Shareholder voting, I think in the medium to long term, that's going to be the huge, huge, huge push in, in in a multitude of different ways. I mean, just last week or this week, you're seeing that there was this huge disruption at the last Shell AGM uh, talking about, you know, we don't think Shell should have this carbon emission, where there's a risk, you're destroying the planet, et cetera. There's this proposal right now on Capitol Hill that's probably one of the largest lobbied proposals, but you know, the correlation, I mean, the ratio of lobbied to amount of news on it is probably <laughs> the largest I've seen in the world. You can Google it, you barely get any information. It's called the Index Act. And this is an act that essentially says the large financial institutions, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, are mandated to include pass-through voting in their ETFs, right? So let's say you want to just invest in a basket of goods and services. Right now, those large financial institutions own your voting rights. And so when they go to a large corporate boardroom, they own 20% of that stock, the board is going to do what they say. They have massive sway, as well as you have other players like ISS and policy providers, and we can talk all about that. But um, this bill has the most bipartisan support from Republicans and Democrats of like any bill put forward. And it's funny, it's the same reason that they reduced the voting legal voting age in the US from 21 to 18. They both both sides think that it's going to support their cause more. So the Republicans are like, we don't want people at BlackRock and et cetera, imposing these ridiculous ESG sanctions on, you know, companies and boards. So we want to detach that power from them. And then the you know democratic side is saying, well, we think the everyday person should have the voice there. Um, so soon it's going to become this thing where every single ETF has to ask you how you want to vote your shares. And so the communication between the retail investor and the public company is going to become way more streamlined. And the biggest issues that retail investors personally care about, yes, they're going to ask questions about profitability, et cetera. You know, my personal opinion is like, any question you can ask about the profitability of a company, so can an analyst, right? But can you really, you probably work for these large public companies. You know what matters in the everyday inner workings. 
can you ask questions around the social responsibility, how they're treating their workers, environmental efforts, et cetera. And you're seeing those questions just happen more and more at AGMs. Boards are hiring people in the ESG space. So medium to long term, that's what I think is probably the most exciting thing. And just on that, um, you know, the shareholder voting and then upcoming ones, how do how does Fenno actually help that, you know, users stay informed about the, those upcoming? Yeah, so uh, right now what we do is we tell you the votes. We have limited coverage now, but every week we're kind of expanding that. Right now we cover S&P 500. Soon it's going to expand quite dramatically. But we tell you the votes that are incoming uh, of companies that you own, companies that are on your watch list, just companies. We have a whole feed of things that are happening. We give you a breakdown of um, what the you know shareholder proposal the people who created the shareholder proposal, what their arguing points are, what they think, why they think this proposal should be passed, et cetera. And then we give you the board's recommendation and their counter argument to you, to it. If there are documents or studies that are done linked in that proposal, we put them directly in the app, easy to understand. We do breakdowns. We give some context around that vote and around the, the companies. You can also go to that company and see the ESG metrics to see if it lines up with what they're saying. We show you past votes, what the percentage of uh, in favor against or, you know, didn't vote essentially are. And um, we put it right front up and center. So, you know, that's one. We have a lot of products we want to put in space about, you know, analyzing the history of it. Why does it matter, et cetera. The second thing that we're working towards is we understand how incredibly difficult it is to actually get involved in these votes. Right. And so institutions vote 82% of their shares, while retail investors vote like 29% of their shares. And there's a reason for that. Institutions have access to tools that retail don't. Probably the biggest one is a voting policy. So look, saying, I care about climate issues. Anytime there's a vote around climate issues, vote me in favor. Because you need to vote for every single ballot item on that ballot in order for your whole vote to cast. What if I really only care about one issue? Uh, what if I only want to elect one person on the board and I don't know anything about all the other people, right? Um, that can be daunting for the everyday person. So, you know, our hope, we're moving towards becoming the first retail brokerage to ever offer voting policies to customers so they can get easily involved, eventually even put votes forward themselves, organize in communities, et cetera, and start to, you know, discuss these votes. So that's that's been our approach and that's going to continually be our approach. Yeah, super exciting. So there'll be many listeners now listening to you and thinking, okay, like, I really want to take this seriously. now. <laughs> I want to start investing, you know, yeah. and, and, and getting updates on, on ESG and the factors because they are important to me. I just maybe haven't been aware of them or had access to do anything about it. So right. what steps would you advise retail investors to just maybe even just begin their journey on starting to consider some of these these ESG kind of factors and, and scores in their future investments or, you know, even their existing portfolio? I mean, the easiest thing I could, easiest thing I could tell is download the Fennel app. Come see what we're about. More data is coming over and over. Um, that's my personal view. <laughs> the real view is to just explore Right. The beauty about investing in the stock market is you have a thesis, you have a hypothesis that no one else has, and you really believe that this is where the market is going. So you need to start to think critically about companies and you need to start to look at these data points. The problem with existing apps is they just show you the same stuff over and over. And it's a sensory overload and there's behavior economics that they put into there to make you trade more. It doesn't matter, but there's a there's a fundamental problem there. So the first is just start to be curious look at these data points and ask yourself, does this data point make the company stronger or does it make it weaker over the time period, right? Given what's happening in the world, given the current situation. We also have the ability on the Fennel app to sort news by these ESG themes and sentiment around them. So it's not just, yes, look at our ESG scores, but come look at the news and say, I only wanna see negative sentiment articles around carbon emissions for this company will show you kind of all of those articles. You can get a deeper insight into the research. So my number one thing is be curious. Look at the proposals. Look at the ESG metrics. I'm sure something in your daily life or your <laughs> decision making, you'll strike a chord and you'll say, well, this is obvious, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. It's been an absolute pleasure. Where can people find you after this podcast? Yeah, so I'm always available on LinkedIn. Please add me, Daniel Naim, on LinkedIn. I'm, you know, love to chat about this stuff all the time. Uh, I also have an Instagram, which is probably not that active, but I'm on there. It's called Daniel W. Naim. That's my personal one. Uh, but then I'd encourage you also to just follow the story of Fennel. So, you know, we have also a LinkedIn page around Fennel and we have our Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all that stuff on Instagram. I think we're Fennel app. So just come follow our journey and check us out. Absolutely. Well, I, I look forward to following and seeing you take over the world. Thank you so much, Daniel, <laughs> and see you soon.